Hi, my name is Christopher Lawrence. I'm a student of biology and we're here in the library. Actually, that's not true. My name is Christopher Lawrence, I'm a DJ and we're at Zook in Singapore. I guess what I do is I do my homework, you know, in the week preceding, um, going through new music, um, collecting a variety of, of sounds. It all falls within kind of the underground progressive house and trance sound. But that being said, I've got to have a wide palette to work from. Uh, you arrive in a city and yes, people there are coming out because they know who you are and they want to hear trance, but they also have their own flavor that they're familiar with and you've got to find a way to quickly adapt into that and then segue into and what I really want to play. <laughs> so, so, it's a bit of creativity. <laughs> it's fine, it's great now that I'm playing CDs. It's quite sad really now the turntables, uh, they're used as uh, CD wallet holders. Because <laughs> like, they're nice and big and you can lay your CDs out on them while you're playing CDs. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love turntables, I love vinyl, it's quite, but at the end it's just kind of nostalgic and there's no real point to, to play it. Um, CDs have taken over is the medium of choice and they're more flexible. Um, I think you can do more with CDs, you've got an immediacy with music, you can be talking to your friend, you know, chatting to them in the afternoon in a hotel, they can tell you, I've just finished a track, let me upload it, you know, see if you like it. I can download it in the hotel room, listen to it, bring it out, you know, burn a CD, bring it to the party and play it that night. I can then go back to the hotel, send them a quick email and say, it rocked the floor. Oh, you need more bass, you know, whatever it takes. But you can do that. You've got that immediacy. And um, I, I just think that's something that, that, for me, outweighs anything. Uh, the Lawrence booth is quite simple. We just have the mixer and then two CDJ 1000s or now the DVJ 1000s. I don't know. I mean, it adds a new dimension, but there's a lot of really quality video jockeys out there right now that, they, they are, that have been doing it in the same way that I've been you know, producing and DJing for years. Those guys have been doing visuals for a long time. Do I think I can compete with them? No. I think what I, I see happening is um, combining forces with somebody like that to you know, create a more cohesive brand to the night or I, you know, the music working in conjunction with it but again I, I, it's not something that I would be doing on my own going out capturing image and running in and trying to do it myself but I, would, I, I am you know, exploring the possibility of working with somebody that could develop the imagery to accompany the music and that I think is fascinating. I mean, like I've seen, yeah, like Tiesto, you know, it, it has, has done that, not him playing the, the, the DVDs, but he's got a guy that goes along with him on tour that captures video in the cities preceding his, you know, Tiesto's arrival, which is quite brilliant, and then that can be incorporated into the night. Um, you know, I could see that you could then capture those images, you know, associate some of those with tracks, maybe the tracks that came from specific countries, I don't know, you know, but you could then... That would swear you could incorporate that is you know into the DVJs. I fill the pages the same way I used to fill my record boxes. I kind of program it with the music that I would anticipate playing earlier in an evening um, in blocks, and then you know the next block might be breaks, or the next block might be next level of higher energy progressive house. And so I've got different styles of music also layered with you know like how a night would normally progress so then as I go through I can jump from section to section go okay well we're gonna skip over this section I think we're ready to move this one and so it's kind of laid out in a not just by sound but how things would move in time and I rotate to, to help do it because when you had vinyl you could flip through and you got a feel or what the record was. Even if you didn't remember what it sounded like, you'd see the album cover and you go, oh yeah, that's what I want to play right now. Well, I open up my CD wallet and every single wallet's got the same, you know, NAM 
gold CD. <laughs> they all look the same with my same handwriting. And um, so, again, it's got to be set up really structured well so that when I'm flipping through, I can find what I want and so that I know that I'm on the right page. It's, <laughs> it's actually, I'm quite anal retentive about the, about the whole thing of how I, I place them in there. But it's something that you have to be familiar with so that when it's in the dark, you can find exactly what you want when you want it. It's at your fingertips. So yeah, it's not a bad question. I spend a lot of time with that. I open it up on the plane and people say, what's this guy doing? I'm shuffling CDs around because I didn't like the, the arrangement the night before. Well, I, I mean, I think digital music was inevitable and a digital you know, revolution. And I think it's just a matter of getting people to choose to pay for the music that they like. I, um, I mean, the old brick and mortar and physical distribution of vinyl is just really archaic. It's wasteful with, of resources, it's wasteful in its effectiveness to get the music out to the people that want it. So digital is far more efficient. That being said, it also means that because it's a simple digital audio file, it's also easy to disseminate. It's also very difficult to control. It just goes out into the wild. But I, I think, and what, what, I, what I would hope is that like what these other artists are, are counting on is that I have no problem with people just downloading them for free and, and checking out the tracks. That's actually good advertising. What I would hope is that if they've downloaded a crummy MP3 but they like the track and they're a DJ and they want to play it out, that then they'll go to a you know a digital distribution site like Beatport, track it down, or Juno.co.uk, they'll go or iTunes and they'll go to a you know spot like that and they'll pay the 99 cents to download the wave or AIF file. And that in turn, you know, goes back eventually to the producer's pocket. Because without the producers, we don't have the music. And I, all of us obviously like music. That's why we're having this digital music revolution. And I think it's getting more music into more people's hands than ever before, which is fantastic. Music really was dying for a while. But again, I, I would just beg people that when you find something you like, pay for it. In the same way as there's software that's shareware. Use it, try it. If you don't like it, fine. Throw it off your computer. But if you do like it, Pay for it. Really just trying to find the balance. I've just recently moved from Los Angeles to Melbourne, Australia. And when I was in Los Angeles, life was very comfortable. The studio that I worked in was there. Um, traveling and doing touring was extremely simple because from Los Angeles, you can get a direct flight to almost anywhere in the world that's never more than about 12 to 14 hours. From Australia, 14 hours from the nearest connecting port and then it's another 10 hours to wherever else you go so I think I, I'm gonna be trying one is getting my head around touring um, being based in Melbourne Australia two is trying to find a way to structure my studio time being that I'll be on the road so much to, to fit music in which is extremely important to me and um, yeah and then the, the development of my label pharmacy music um, this year it's actually really gonna take off. I've got a lot of good stuff lined up so that that's what that's I think the the key elements of two thousand and eight.